comedian Peter King. What would you think of that, Pete? That was just lovely. Yeah, that's what I thought. All right, here's the... Uh, He's tough- opening for <laughs> Charles Dolan. Or no, Jim Dolan. <laughs> Jim Dolan. He's uh, Peter King from uh, the MMQB.com, also Sports Illustrated. You can see him on Football Night in America. Let's start with a tough actual football question on the field. Is Devin Hester a Hall of Famer? I just was thinking that last night, and I thought of it this summer when I was in Falcons camp interviewing him. I'm always loath to I, – I won't say unequivocally he's a Hall of Famer. All I will say, because I just think that that is fraught with problems. In my opinion, if he never played another down, that's the question you have to ask because you don't know if he's ever going to play another down. You figure that he's going to play a lot more. But if he never plays another down, I think he has a great – not a good, but a great chance for the Hall of Fame. Did it change with Ray Guy getting in as a punter that – this? specialization of the sport is not to me because I would I'm I've never I never was against Ray guy because I didn't think a punter should be in the Hall of Fame I just for all those years thought that Ray guy hadn't distanced himself from the Gerald Wilson's of the world whereas if you look at Devin Hester um, he is distancing himself uh, at a very important spot on the field at a the lightning spot, you know, the punt return, the return area, which decides games. Dan, I'm among those, among those who who can't convince anybody, but I think Steve Tasker should be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame because I think he is the best gunner, he's the best special teams player overall in NFL history. And I think that person, that somebody with that mantle deserves a spot in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I also wonder about Devin Hester with these numbers since we've devalued the kickoff. It's basically right. null and void. So who's going to catch up with those numbers? Well, that means that the punt returns, uh, the guy who's a great punt returner now is significantly more important just because he's going to have more opportunities than the kickoff return guy. Mike Westoff, the former special teams coach of the Jets, has said this passionately. He thinks the kickoff is dead in the NFL. Yeah. Even though the kickoff is going to continue, I, I think eventually we're going to get to the point where literally there isn't a kickoff. Um, but I don't think we'll ever get to that point about punts. But this is what they wanted to do without saying they wanted to do it. They were yes. trying to add more protection yes. on kickoff. So they basically said we're going to get rid of them without saying we're right. going and to get rid the of them. Right, and in the first year where they changed uh, where they're kicking off from, you know, where they moved it up, concussions on kickoff plays were down 40% from one year to the next. So it worked. So I, I don't doubt in five years. I think in five years there's a good chance there won't be a kickoff. He's Peter King from Sports Illustrated, the MMQB, and Football Night in America joining us, Dan Patrick Show. I think you asked in your column, uh, where is the commissioner right now? Uh, where has he been? And I think these issues are so important, Peter, that I think that he should hold almost a state of the union for the NFL, but do it on national TV because it has to do with so many things involving so many people. We're dealing with children. We're dealing with wives, domestic abuse, child abuse, that I think he needs to be out in front of this. No question. Dan, I think it would be a great idea for him to reprise what he does every year at the uh, at the Super Bowl, he makes a pretty long statement about the state of the game, and then he opens it up to questions for 45 minutes. That's what needs to happen now. He could say what he wants, but he also cannot just leave it at a speech. Uh, he needs to respond to a lot of questions that he voluntarily is not going to address. But, you know, I was told this week that one of the things, you know, he wants to make sure before he says anything – that he is very clear on some of the new policies that the league is laying out as far as, uh, you know, the uh, uh, women's issues, domestic violence issues. Uh, And they've been working really long hours trying to get those things right in the league office. But I, I don't, I mean, it's not that I don't mean I don't care about it because obviously you care, but he, you know, his league is on fire and he has got to come out and talk soon like three days ago but he's got to come out and talk now adrian peterson gonna play again this year 
Boy, I, I doubt it, Dan. I, I, I doubt it. Uh, too many people saw those pictures. You can't unsee those pictures. And uh, it's like the Ray Rice video. You can't unsee that video. I'm not saying that neither one of the, either one of those guys will never play again. I happen to think both of them will play again. But I don't think either one of them will play again this year. Is this crisis mode for the NFL? Seems like it. Um, I don't think it's going to overthrow the league or anything like that, but they are at a crisis point, and they finally have to take the domestic violence uh, issues very, very seriously involving their players. I think in the past they viewed it oftentimes as uh, uh, as a one-off, you know, as a one-time event. And there have been too many of them now uh, for the league to just to say we're not going to do something in a – kind of a revolutionary way to, to address it. They have to do that now, and they got to get it right. I know Carolina made that de- decision with Greg Hardy. The Vikings made that decision with Adrian Peterson. How much of a role did the NFL office have in saying to these franchises, this is what I think you need to do here? Well, I think what happened in the case, because the Adrian Peterson thing happened first, um, I think that Jeff Pash, the league's attorney, came up with the idea of this exempt list, the commissioner's exempt list, where, you know, Roger Goodell has the ability and the power to literally remove a guy from a roster, assuming that everybody is on the same page with it. He can remove a guy from a roster, and he won't count against the 53-man roster. You'd have to pay him, but... He won't count against the roster. And I think it is, in this case, for these two guys, the best solution because these teams just don't know what to do right now with these situations. And, I mean, I think the 49ers, I mean, I've said this publicly, I think the 49ers are doing the right thing with Ray McDonald because I don't think that in most situations that an accusation should remove a player from the field for good. Um, You know, I don't think, like Mark Davis of the Raiders has said, once a guy is accused of domestic violence, he should be removed with pay until he proves his innocence. I don't think that's, I don't think that should happen at all. I think that a person's, if a guy is adamant that he's innocent, I think his innocence should prevail. Now, the Arizona Cardinals did it different with Dwyer much different with Dwyer. And I think that is a tremendously interesting case. And the Cardinals must have had some compelling evidence from the police for Bruce Arians and uh, the Bidwills to, to react like that. We'll come back with Peter. We'll actually talk some football games this weekend. You spent some time, I think, with Peyton Manning uh, recently. Recently, yeah, not this week. Oh, okay. Yeah. And the importance of that win. The game in Seattle is more important to the Seahawks or the Broncos? We'll ask Peter that. A few other questions. Are there any trends that uh, have developed that he sees being season-long trends, not after two weeks? So half past the hour, Peter King will continue with us right here on the Dan Patrick Show. A couple of things football-wise. First of all, the game this weekend between Seattle and Denver is more important to who? Um, I think it's more important to Denver. For Denver's psyche, Denver has, if you count the nickelback Bradley Roby, their rookie from Ohio State, they will have 10 of 12 different starters on defense than they had in the Super Bowl. John Elway has not done a moderate reconstruction of this team. He's overhauled the conference champion. You know, obviously Manning stays, and and I think there are three guys who've come off IR to resume starting jobs. Um, you know, like Clady. But in general, if you if you have 10 different starters of your 12, including your nickel on defense, that says to me, we're really unhappy with what our defense was. And they haven't clicked all together yet. They've had a few too many generous drives in the first two weeks. But I think it's really important that, I mean, I talked to Elway this week and he said, you know, we, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said, we have to make it so that we don't look at our offense every game like you guys got to score 35 for us to win. We need to establish a defensive mentality, and that's what the idea is. Aqib Tlaib, physical presence. T.J. Ward, physical presence. 
you know, Terrence Knight and physical presence. I think they really want to become a more Parcelsian type defense. Peyton Manning's legacy. You lose that game against Seattle. Um, you lose to Seattle. I, I, I don't know where these things rank when we start to look at great quarterbacks. But with Peyton not winning those games, not that it was all on him, but how much does that affect his overall view, ranking, stature, in your opinion? I think it's got to play into the equation. I mean, he, there's no question it's going to play into the equation with him. Um, but I don't think it's the be-all, end-all thing. I've never thought that you should be judged based on the number of Super Bowls you win as a quarterback or as anything. But it's a factor. I, I just don't think that because Ted Williams didn't win a World Series that we ought to denigrate him as a player. Now, it is true that there have been some of these Super Bowls and some of the big games that Peyton Manning has not played very well, no question about it. But there have been other big games where he's played very well. So I don't, I don't, I don't think that he gets a D for big game playing. Uh, based on, you know, a couple of pretty average to below average performances in Super Bowls. But there's almost a Greg Maddox feel to him. They make it look effortless, but yeah. Greg Maddox had one World Series that he won. Uh, was not a great postseason performer. I don't know if there's an analogy uh, there, but I, I just sort of thought that up in the moment here, that Peyton's awesome, great, built for the regular season. Is he built for those individual games? was Maddox built for an individual series in the postseason? You know, I look at some of the games where Manning's uh, reputation has taken a hit. For instance, the game against Baltimore in the playoffs where they lost in double overtime. And I'll never forget that game because for the last quarter, you know, I was standing in the end zone watching the game, and I watched as he rolled out to the right and threw for Brandon Stokely, and, and he threw a wounded duck in Corey Graham. Not a wounded duck, but he threw a soft pass across his body where you're saying, no, 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 don't do it, but he did it. And that, for a couple of reasons, I mean, first of all, it's a dumb play to make. But secondly, he just, you know, he still was not very strong at that point. His mm -hmm. arm was not very strong, and I think he he underestimated the weakness in his arm a few times that season, but never more uh, damagingly than in that game. So I think that has something to do with it. But, <clears throat> Dan, there's no escaping that he could have and should have played better in some of these big games. And other quarterbacks, some other quarterbacks, have played better uh, in the very big games than Manning has. Including Eli. So yep. if you're going to devalue yeah. Super Bowl wins, I don't know if that's a fair term to use, but... If it's not the be-all, end-all for quarterbacks, then Eli Manning's not a Hall of Famer. Um, probably not, but I do think you have to take it all into account. I think you have to – that's why if somebody said, like, the day Kurt Warner retired, you know, one of the things I, I said, you know, I am glad that we have a five-year waiting period so that we can really analyze and let Kurt Warner's career sink in. It's one of the craziest careers in NFL history, without any question. And I still am not sure which way I'm going to vote on Kurt Warner because he has had a totally strange career. So that's why I want to have that extra time. I really want to have that extra time to think about guys like Kurt Warner, to think about Eli Manning. You're not going to have to think very long about Peyton Manning, but I want to have the extra time to think about those guys. Would you rather have Kurt Warner's career or Eli Manning's? Um, probably would rather have Eli's career because he's won t two Super Bowls and he's he's been, even though Kurt's peak was better than almost anybody's peak ever, you know, for for, say, three years or whatever it was. You know, Eli was a little bit of, uh, you know, the slow and steady wins the race. And, he, you know, Eli has never been a fabulous regular season player. He's had some very good regular seasons, but nobody's had a run like Kurt Warner had with those Rams.
Give me the trend. Maybe it's not a trend yet after a couple of weeks, but what have you seen so far that will continue to play out the rest of the regular season? Um, I think one of the things that we've started to see, Dan, I think we're going to have a record year for passing efficiency and completion percentage and, and, and players who we've never seen before be very accurate passers. I think their accuracy is going to improve because I think defensive backfields are changing the way they play. I think they're being less physical, and I think they're seeing early on that if you redirect a player. Now, last night, it was it was funny, the Vincent Jackson touchdown where he pushed off when it was 56 nothing. I think that was a mercy rule touchdown, you know? I don't know. But, uh, I, I mean, in general, I think you're seeing – most defensive backfields struggling some with the fact that you can't do that chicken fighting downfield because they're going to call it. Now, I want to see how that's going to be called all season, but I've noticed the first couple of weeks they're calling a lot of the ticky-tack stuff. We'll see if that continues. How bad is Oakland? How bad is Jacksonville? Uh, I think Oakland is is really bad, and unless they get good performance from a good performance from Derek Carr every Sunday, it's going to be really really hard for them to win more than two or three games. Uh, you can see right now that uh, that you know obviously they don't really know how they're going to play week to week, and they're more of a collection of players right now formed in the off season. Justin Tuck, Lamar Woodley, and you know, brought in a bunch of guys. They're more of a collection of players than they are a team right now. Jacksonville, I mean, I'm I was really surprised last week at you know the the defensive performance. Their secondary was just horrendous last week in Washington. The first two Kirk Cousins touchdown passes, or the first touchdown pass, and then the one that was ruled a touchdown, but was then brought back to the one yard line. Jacksonville didn't cover Washington's receivers. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you just say, how does that happen in the NFL? I don't know how it happens. It happened again last night, though, because Tampa Bay, Phil Simms said it near the end of the game. He said, I can't believe how many times their guys are running wide open. So I think uh, Jacksonville has got to get their defense right, and Gus Bradley will. I have faith he's going to get the job done there. The best team right now is yes, who? Ah. I just knocked out my uh, thing. Sorry. Oh, you knocked out your headphones? Yeah. Oh, uh, you don't need it if you can hear me. Here. You know what? The best team right now is Seattle. And to me, I think Seattle, um, that that loss is going to do them well because I think they're going to come in Sunday. And Pete Carroll really has basically said this week, he said, see, we're not infallible. And I think sometimes losses are good, especially losses that happen when they happen. Now, the one thing, the only thing that would really worry me if I were Seattle coming into this game this week is that, you know, Peyton Manning is very anal when it comes to studying. Adam Gase is extremely, an extremely good film student. I, I don't know how Denver's going to play. I really don't. And I think Seattle's going to win the game, but I think it's going to be a great game. If you were on Sports Jeopardy and it was just football categories, how would you do? Um, I do really well in baseball. <laughs> well, no, but I, so I have to put baseball in there. No, no, oh. but I would do. I do pretty well. I think I would do well. I could. I could answer some hockey questions. I wouldn't be great at the NBA. Um, I'd be pretty good. I'd. Do, I'd get every college nickname. I think. Um, I mean, I know Gustavus Adolphus's nickname. They're the Golden Gusties. I mean, I'm, I'm a sicko with nicknames, but uh, I think I would do pretty well. I wouldn't be Ken Jennings, but I would do pretty well. So if I put you with Clayton Mortensen and Shefty. Yeah. And Ian Rappaport. Is it sports Jeopardy? All or only football Jeopardy? Only football. Okay. How would you do? Um, I would definitely hold my own. I, I don't know that I'd win. I don't know if they're, if they're, like, for instance, because I'm on the Hall of Fame committee, we have to study an awful lot of history. So, I mean, I'll know Otto Graham and Don Hudson better than they would. You by can far. call your shot here if you want. I mean, just go Joe Namath that you would dominate. I don't think I would dominate because I don't know if any of those guys are football history nerds. 
But if you if we did it on the 95 year history, this is the 95th season of the NFL. If if you had if we had football jeopardy based on the 95 year history and you put me up against these guys, I think I would do very well. Take that, Mort. Yeah. And Shefty. <laughs> and Johnny Good Times. Johnny Clayton. You realize he had a ponytail. Of course he did. Yeah. You're the one who made it famous. I, you can confirm it, right? I, I, I can, yeah. <laughs> and I can also confirm that he went on the road with Slayer. He did? <laughs> yeah, of course he did. He went on the road with Slayer. Uh, the MMQB.com. You can find uh, Peter's column there and uh, Football Night in America. He's there as well in Sports Illustrated. Pete, good to see you again. Thanks for stopping by. All right, Dan, thank you. We'll get to your phone calls coming up. This is the Dan Patrick Show.